Good afternoon and welcome to today's Live with Leadership, People, Place, Policy, and Science Matter. This webinar is being recorded and this webinar is not for press. We urge all participants to ask their questions throughout the session by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We will try to get to as many questions as possible towards the end. If you have any tech-related issues, we ask that you put those in the chat box and someone will try to assist you with your needs. I now would like to welcome Guillermo Chacon who will facilitate today's conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Guillermo Chacon and I'm the president of the Latino Commission on AIDS and founder of the Hispanic Health Network. Um, I'm also a brand new member of the Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS, known as PACHA, and so excited to have uh, such an important conversation to date. Um, I also, uh, last week was uh, a very exciting week for the HIV community. We observed World AIDS Date uh, on December 1st, and we welcome with open arms the release of the outdated National HIV Strategy. This afternoon, uh, we will be talking about the uh, two longtime federal employees and leaders in our nation's response to HIV. I'm so excited to be joined by uh, Dr. Jonathan Mervin from the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention and Dr. Laura Cheever uh, from the Health Resource and Service Administration known as HERSA. And again, um, I would like to introduce first Dr. Jonathan Merman. Dr. Merman is the director of the National Center for HIV and Viral Hepatitis, STIs, and TB Prevention at the CDC. Dr. Merman, please tell us uh, uh, what the title of today's session, People, Place, Policy, and Science Matters. And you know what means to you and why it will be so important as we continue to work toward ending the HIV epidemic in the, in the United States. The floor is yours. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, uh, Guillermo and Anne. And I, I, I really appreciate the thought that went behind um, setting up the session with this topic. Um, you know, HIV wraps itself around all aspects of our lives, sex, love, compassion, equity, discrimination, human rights, um, all of those. And therefore, people, place, policy, and science matter when it comes to working towards ending the HIV epidemic. Um, you know, for most of us, we do the work we do because people matter. Disparities will naturally form in an unjust society, as we've seen for years with HIV and STIs, and as we've seen over the past two years with COVID-19. However, we also know that these disparities are not inevitable. If we embrace holistic approaches that recognize social context and strive for health equity, and if we see a person and a community's overall health as a goal and work for outcomes, that include physical and mental health benefits, then we will do better. And we know that we can't succeed alone, whether we're activists or researchers or public health workers or clinicians, documenting and calling out disparities and inequities across groups among people are important to document because they inspire a sense of injustice that moves us to act to change the world as powerfully and effectively and quickly as possible. So what we saw and learned from the COVID-19 epidemic is that uh, our nation's policies, structures, and social environment will inherently create uh, an inequitable situation unless we explicitly and thoughtfully work against it. Because social and economic determinants drive health disparities, we see major differences across income and employment and housing. And we saw major racial and ethnic disparities in the beginning of COVID-19 um, including among Hispanic Latinos and African Americans, and we saw them lessen over time. With HIV, we know about these major disparities. So for HIV and STI infections, they're, they're over 150 times higher among MSM and transgender women than heterosexuals. And Hispanic Latino and Black uh, gay and bisexual men have much higher rates of HIV and STIs than others. So these numbers reflect not just differences, but preventable inequities. And because of this, we won't succeed in preventing HIV and its morbidity and mortality unless we succeed in decreasing these disparities. And we won't succeed in decreasing these disparities until we address these social, economic, and political determinants that lead to these injustices. So in a positive light, we have seen that with concerted effort, 
disparities can be ameliorated, although I will state up front it would have been better and easier if we prevented them from occurring in the first place. Uh, but for example, over 10 years ago, the highest incidence of HIV in the nation was among African-American MSM below the age of 25. And with strong effort from the communities and public health officials, we've reduced the incidence among that group by over, well over 30%. Place also matters. Many times we understate the importance of where we live as an underlying factor for how long we live. And there are extreme disparities in geographic distribution of our infections, due in large part to the fact that resources and risks are not distributed equally or equitably in our country. So social and economic determinants lead to these disparities, and we should spend time identifying and describing them. But our task is also to answer the question, where should we focus and what should we do? And we know and have talked about for several years that about 50% of new HIV infections are occurring in about 50 counties. Um, so in the case of HIV, everyone and everywhere is affected, but not equally. So for to tackle disparities and get the job done, we need to focus efforts, but not forget the whole. Policy also matters. Uh, you know, if we want to make large scale differences, we often have to think on the systemic level and change policy. When I began working in HIV about 35 years ago, I was compelled by a sense of pursuing justice, of making the world a better place, and of working with and supporting people who, who others would not. So policy change can maximize reach and effectiveness of interventions by leveraging existing systems. And laws can provide long-term sustainable solutions in a way that temporarily funded projects cannot. In doing so, policies can lead to behavior change and improve public health, just the way well thought out and implemented programs can. And these can be small scale policies like standing orders for HIV and viral hepatitis screening and health centers to large scale changes such as revising rescinding HIV criminalization or gender discrimination laws, expanding Medicaid, establishing state laws enabling syringe service programs and working to ensure an alignment between federal, state, local and institutional policies. And good quality, meaningful science also matters. When it comes to ending the HIV epidemic, there are several game-changing clinical interventions um, without which would be uh, in a very different public health environment if they didn't exist. So these include accurate tests for HIV, antiretroviral medication so effective that it prevents HIV mortality and transmission, and as PrEP acquisition. You know, PrEP reminds us that cutting edge science can, can create powerful tools for change, but they need to be available and used by the populations who need them or they're of no use. And PrEP use has increased dramatically over the past few years. And now about 25% of the people CDC estimates as being eligible are taking it. But we looked at the data and they showed major disparities, although they are getting a bit better. Um, and then I also think that, that um, some of the clinical research for long-acting ART and prevention treatments that promise to improve access and adherence to protect the health of people with or at risk of HIV are really on the, on the next cusp for us, and they'll make us a, a substantial difference. And then lastly, moving science from the bench to the bed, bedside and from the clinic to the community benefits everyone. So we need to think about making sure that we use the science that does exist. So I do think that people, place, policy, and science matter, and I hope we'll continue to keep putting people first, focus on equity, put our money where our epidemic is, and leverage policy as a public health tool. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mario. Thank you for your insight. And uh, you know, now I have the, uh, the pleasure also to introduce Dr. Laura Schieber as an Associate Administrator for the HIV AIDS Bureau at HRSA. And Dr. Schieber, same question to you. What does the title of today's session, People, Place, Policy, and Science Matters? means to you and why it would be so important to continue our work together to end the HIV epidemics in the U.S. and the territories. Dr. Shiva. Great. Thank you, Guillermo. And thanks to HIV.gov for inviting me to be with all of you here today. This is such an important conversation to be having, especially following our commemoration of World AIDS Day last week, you said, and the rollout of the updated national HIV AIDS strategy. Um, so we have made great progress in the last 40 years but we know there is still much work to be done and we remain committed to ending the HIV epidemic in the US. So today's Live with Leadership theme, people, places, policy, and science matter is important because these elements have really are central and have been central to the work we do in the Health Resources and Services Administration's RIMWIT HIV AIDS program. So uh, the RIMWIT program, as many of you know, is a comprehensive system with HIV primary care, medication, and essential support services. Um, uh, that serve over half a million people with HIV in the US. 
each year. That's over half of all the people living with uh, HIV in this country. And since the law's passage, the guiding principles of the program have been health equity, stopping stigma, and reducing health disparities. An important part of this uh, program is that decisions about what to fund in a community are made at the local and jurisdictional level, engaging people with HIV. So for more than the last three decades, the Ryan White program has played a critical role in the US public health response to HIV. And that's why what was once a deadly disease is now a manageable chronic, chronic condition, uh, but that requires that there's access to high quality HIV care, medications and support services needed to engage and remain, uh, for people to engage in remaining care. The program's success is in our ability to meet people where they are, so we're talking about people, and to provide those essential support services coupled with medical care to our clients using a patient-centered approach. Uh, so in this epidemic, it can't be over-medicalized. And I think uh, Dr. Murray was just talking about that. Uh, the Ryan Way uh, program's funding of essential support services in addition to medical care means that the program can help people address some of those social determinants of health that drive health disparities that Jana was just discussing. Um, in the last decade, the Ryan White program has made important progress in reducing health disparities among people with HIV. Uh, just last week, we released our, our uh, 2020 Ryan White HIV AIDS program annual client level data report. And the report highlights that in 2020, we continue to see an upward trend in viral suppression among Ryan White program clients re receiving medical care across all priority populations. Um, this is a very impressive, um, as these improvements occurred during that first part of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in 2020, 89.4% of program clients receiving HIV uh, medical care were virally suppressed. Uh, and this is up from 69.5% of Ryan White clients virally suppressed in 2010, when the first national HIV AIDS strategy was released. Um, and we know that the Ryan White program is critical to ensuring individuals with HIV are linked to and retained in care, are able to stay on their medicine and remain virus suppressed. So the work in front of us includes our ability to, to maintain people in care for the long haul and engage people living with HIV who are out of care. So in many cases, that means shifting our models of care to lower barriers and integrating more services, particularly mental health and substance use treatment services into HIV care settings. We've seen some amazing innovations during the COVID pandemic, and we need to continue with the momentum of those changes. Um, and that really is because we know we have the tools today to end the HIV epidemic in the US. Um, and that is only possible by meeting people once again, where they are and thinking differently how to reach those out of care. Ryan White providers all over this country are working with patients to figure out how to provide services more effectively and to gather data on what is working. So we at HRSA are working to disseminate effective evidence-informed interventions among our grant recipients to accelerate engagement and retention in care for those people who haven't yet been effectively reached. Um, this summer, in order to further that, we released uh, the Ryan White HIV AIDS Program Best Practice Compilation, which documents best practice strategies and interventions that have been shown to improve HIV outcomes in the real world setting, in those places where people are getting care that can be re replicated by other programs. Um, it was developed with extensive input and collaboration with Ryan White recipients and subrecipients, as well as federal and non-federal staff. Um, in 2020, once again, right at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, HRSA awarded approximately 63 million uh, additional uh, dollars uh, to fund 60 Ryan White recipients and $54 million to 195 HRSA supported health centers as part of the Ending the HIV Epidemic in the US initiative. And our recipients made significant progress towards implementing their activities despite the challenges of COVID. Um, with this new funding, they were able to do many of the things I just talked about that we need to do. Um, for, uh, for our uh, Ryan White recipients, these EHE activities, including engaging community members to ask them what needed to be done differently and, in, and encouraging and developing new partnerships and delivering services differently. Um, EHE recipients implemented enhanced uh, linkage to care and re-engagement activities, including the establishment of rapid re-engagement protocols after missed appointments and low barrier clinics that provided high intensity support incentives and care coordination. Um, rapid ART programs were also implemented by many EHE recipients um, for clients newly linked to care and those re-engaged. 
and many EHE recipients engaged peer navigators and community health workers to help clients navigate their HIV care in the general health system. And those are just a few examples of, of why and how people, uh, place, policy, and science are so critical to the work we do every day. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shiva. And, and again, you know, we send our, our heartfelt uh, recognition to both CDC and HERSA for the amazing work. Um, uh, I really want to have one more question uh, for both of you, and then we're going to open it uh, to try to accommodate uh, from the audience. But uh, for each of you, uh, the updated national HIV AIDS strategy uh, was released just last week, last uh, Wednesday, December 1st. And why is this strategy is important uh, and how it will impact your work, each of you? If you want to start, Dr. Merman. Well, thank you very much. I, you know, perhaps most importantly, the strategy shows commitment um, from the president and the administration to bold goals. And it helps guide communities and the government and the private sector on a similar path towards ending the HIV epidemic. Um, I think there's a, two other aspects that have been expanded in this version compared to the prior one. Um, one of them is that it explicitly and directly incorporates uh, social determinants of health and inequity as areas of focus. Uh, it examine, you know, recognizes racism as a public health crisis and a serious threat to the health of millions of Americans. And it, um, encourages us to think about leveraging uh, those um, factors to do a better job. Um, and lastly, I think it, it, it also embraces the importance of policy and law as public health tools so that we can um, ad address them for longer term sustainable change. Dr. Schieber, please. Yeah, so um, I agree with everything Jana says, as I usually do. Um, and I really think that the National HIV AIDS Strategy, because it does provide a framework and direction for the administration's policies, as well as research and programs, um, it's important that it helps us all sort of row in the same direction. It helps us all get on board. Um, and this specifically has an emphasis on addressing uh, racial and gender disparities, which is so important because those disparities exist today. I can tell you that when the first uh, National HIV AIDS Strategy re re released in 2010, it really helped us within the Ryan White program focus on key populations and viral suppression in a different way than we had before. And the, the improvement that we've had in our viral suppression rate since 2010 um, are in part a result of this very focused effort and very uh, the, the direction that we were given through the national strategy. Um, the other thing is from my perspective, um, since, the, since this plan comes from the White House, it takes a whole government, whole of government as well as a whole of society approach to ending the epidemic. So the strategy really helps bring Department of Justice, Department of Labor, Department of Education, Department of Housing and Urban Development in a it, to the table to address the HIV epidemic. And that is huge because they bring different and needed expertise and funding to our fight. Um, and I think John was really getting to that with the social determinants of health. We need different people at the table who have the authority and the funding to address some of those things. Um, and these other parts of government are fundamental, um, as I said, to address the social determinants of health that really do help drive those disparities. Um, and so uh, the types of work that, that I think they'll be doing, including, will include things like addressing discriminatory laws and creating employment, educational and housing opportunities in a different way than what we're doing today. I think the other part of implementation of, of the National HIV AIDS Strategy is it lets us think creatively about how we're, at, we're, we're interacting with our partners within our own program and across the Department of Human Health, Health and Human Services. Um, particularly the syndemic approach is highlighted in this year's strategy is important because it, it really helps us address um, hepatitis more effectively as well as combating the rising rates of STD, substance use disorder and mental illness. Uh, many of these were uh, actually magnified during the COVID-19 pandemic. And by thinking about them together rather than in separate silos, it really will help us have that renewed energy um, to move forward toward greater health equity. So we're really excited it's here. Um, we are working on our implementation plan and we're looking forward to working across the country on it. Yes, thank you both. Uh, and and I, I just wanna echo that. It was so important and show leadership having the president unveiling this updated 2225 
uh, to 22 to 2025, uh, and then the campaign to NHIB by 2030 is a light of hope that will be matched by our commitment of uh, working together. Now we have like eight minutes, and I, I want to just cover a couple of questions. Any other, anyone want to ask any question? Please use the um, Q and A in your box. And anything that we'll not be able to cover, we will follow up with with each of you. But a question is on prep. PrEP is a key component of the national HIV AIDS strategy and our efforts to end HIV in the United States and territories. I really want to uh, uh, highlight, uh, if you could please uh, share, uh, hold on, I lost the question. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, how can we do a better job to increase the uptake? And then can you talk a little bit about the efforts to increase access and also utilization of PrEP? Anyone, Dr. Schieber, Schieber or? I'm sorry, could you, could you repeat the question, Guillermo? Yeah, I'm sorry. basically yeah. PrEP is a very important component. Mm. How can we increase access and util utilization, I'm sorry, of PrEP throughout the nation and the territories? I, I could start and then I think pass it on to Dr. Cheever. I think the, the, the first is that it, it, it is, you know, the science shows that it works. It works extremely well if you take it as directed. And there's even new, you know, science about new methods, not just oral medicine, but also uh, um, an injection that's taken every two months. And there's research in things like once a month um, pills and maybe implants that could last a year or so. So there's a lot of new areas to show that PrEP works. And I think it's, um, it's, it's one of those really important tools that enable us to get to some of these goals. So the problem is it's, it, it's the medication itself is extremely expensive. Um, it's costly. Um, and so some things had to change at the large scale level. And some of them were that the, um, the uh, US Preventive Services Task Force gave it a category A recommendation, its highest recommendation, which meant that the Affordable Care Act requires that most insurers, public and private, will cover it with no copay. It's a preventive care intervention. And that mean, that is quite helpful. Um, there's also programs that help support people who have no insurance. Um, and, um, and, there's increasing numbers of providers who understand PrEP and, and, and are comfortable prescribing it. Given all that though, we haven't reached where we need to reach. And the question becomes, how do we go to that next step of operationalizing these? Once you set that enabling environment, which is not perfect yet, but it's better than for many other interventions, um, how do you make sure that, there's, that there are people who are comfortable providing in all the different areas of the country? How do we make sure that, that people are asked about their sexual practices and behaviors so that they, if they are at risk, we can enable them to have pre-exposure prophylaxis? Um, how can we reduce the costs and the, because the barriers the barriers to insurers are still, they're still gonna to try to put in barriers as much as possible because that's the natural state of things that will save money. And so we have to kind of reduce those things. And how do we also work on a communications and, and kind of engendering trust in this new intervention, which I think that has really turned from people being more wary to actually people more embracing it, but it's still in certain communities, it's not as well um, accepted or understood or trusted. And there's sometimes stigma associated with taking PrEP. And so we wanna reduce those things too. Um, but I do think there's a lot of hope. I mean, 25% sounds small, it's certainly less than we want, but, um, but I think that it is, you know, it's, it's higher than it was. And um, even though COVID um, stalled some of the increases we were seeing, I think we're back up with the momentum again. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Schieber, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, so within HRSA, the uh, PrEP is being distributed through the health centers. And the health center program is an amazing program because uh, it, they serve a huge number of people that are living at or below the federal poverty level and racial and ethnic minorities. And we know that they can help really reduce disparities. They, they, they were the go-to people to uh, reduce some of those disparities we saw in vaccination rates, for example, across the country for COVID. So I think by engaging the health centers and really giving them the tools they need uh, to be able to, uh, to deliver PrEP services will make a big difference, both in terms of PrEP, but also in terms of other STDs. Once again, getting to that syndemic approach, because um, with that, you're with uh, really implementing PrEP, you're talking about having uh, more consistent discussions about sex, which doesn't always happen in this country, and, um, and much more um, STD testing. So um, I think that the health centers are an important part of this project. Correct. 
the, the last question is, uh, you know, President Biden, HIV's strategy uh, include new emphasis on American aging uh, with HIV. How this emphasis will change the ways that we implement strategies to end the HIV epidemic? Yeah, so that's a great question. On the care and treatment side of things, we in the Brian White program have been really focusing on this um, pretty intensely over the last couple of years based on input from community members who said, you know, I'm aging with HIV, but my quality of life is not necessarily improving. So what are we going to do things, how are we going to do things differently? Um, so we've had a number of activities around training our clinicians in how to better manage some of the um, comorbidities or things like frailty that occur as people age as well as the multiple comorbidities we know people um, with, uh, with HIV get at a younger age than the general population. So we're working on that. And um, we're also working on um, how, do we, how do we make sure that the, the larger aging community, the resources in the community are ready for people with HIV as they age and ready for LGBTQ people as they enter aging services. So we have worked really closely with the part of the federal government that has funding, that they fund aging services in every community around this country. Um, and uh, they've worked closely with us to make sure that, that their, uh, funded, their funded recipients are ready uh, for people with HIV. I think the most important thing they've done this year is they have state uh, uh, plans where they have to tell the government what they're gonna do for key populations. And they've added people with aging with HIV as part of those state plans so that states are having to stop and think and tell the federal government what they are going to do as people with HIV are aging. So our goal is not to reinvent, uh, to start from scratch with aging services. There are lots of aging services, but make sure the aging services are ready for people with HIV as they age. Dr. Merman, want to add anything? Um, only I agree very much with what Dr. Cheever is saying. I mean, part of CDC's role has been to to document changes in the epidemiology and show this kind of a, the cohort of people with HIV is getting older and I'm having uh, um, different health problems than what were, you know, happened earlier, and also different kind of uh, needs in general. Um, but, but some of, I, I just want to touch on some of the other questions related to, first, is there going to be a national HIV prevention conference in 2022? And I think the answer is no, sadly. Um, it's, it's, yeah. But, but I do think it relates to this, another question that's about, you know, how do we, you know, are we developing these implementation plans in the local communities to try to bring the community together with government to have joint um, direction that's going to and, and hold each other accountable to getting the job done and getting the resources to where they need to be. So it kind of, I think this ties into that, having people with HIV integra integrated into all of the decision making and information gathering and checking on whether things are going well and in the government, um, like we have in our agencies, can really make a difference. Um, it also um, relate related to the aging issues. I think we always have to pay attention and listen to the people who are affected by HIV. And so recognizing that it's not only um, the people at highest risk of infection who tend to be younger, but it is actually a lot of the people who are living with um, HIV and what that means to them. And um, so we learn, and I think our programs are better by embracing um, that change and um, doing our best to change our programs to meet their needs. Yeah, and I must say that this is particularly important for um, people aging with HIV because this is the first cohort of people that are really growing old, having been on antiretrovirals and lived with HIV for 30 and 40 years, right? So uh, they are pioneers and we need to listen closely to what their experience is and what they tell us they need. Thank you both to, to join us today. Uh, again, Dr. Chiver and Dr. Merman, to, to everybody around you, uh, both of CDC and HRSA. Our, our gratitude for all the work that you have been doing for years, but also the things around you. And please join us tomorrow. We have an uh, updated on the implementation of the HIV AIDS strategy, very important. Please, please visit hiv.gov and get all the information. And a reminder to all of you that the, this, the strategy also addresses stigma, especially you know, trying to confront homophobia and transphobia in our communities. And again, together we will end HIV. Happy holidays and, and be safe, please, everyone. Thank you. Gracias, Guillermo. Yeah, gracias, gracias, Guillermo, and, and really appreciate your leadership. Oh, take care. Thank you.